I talk about what's going on in the space flight industry. I don't know if you guys know. I'm kind of a fan of that. So we will start up EJ's Space and Rocket Review. And then we'll get back to Manor Lords in a little bit. That game's fun, dude. It's a good time. Switch up the YouTube stream as well. Save that over there. Save that over there. Dr. Death. Retrieved ad time. Roll. Okay, I'll roll. Okay. Ooh. Nope, no ad time for you. Sorry, pal. All right, I'm going to put us on the title card for a second. I'll be right back. Just going to grab something to drink real quick, and then we'll start.
All right, dudes, we got links ready to go. Got links ready to go for space news. Cause I got a couple. Let's uh. Let's see what we got. Discovery, go at throttle up. Hey, Admiral, fifty-six month resub. Thank you. So, Starlink actually scrubbed over the weekend. Which is interesting. Starlink 7 8 out of Vandenberg should be happening a little bit Discovery. later in the week. I believe it's uh, tomorrow. Uh, I have a Freedom of Information Act Starlink mishap investigation. We got that. Got to figure out how to get to that one. All right. Some space news. These two go together. Okay. All right. Let's see. What do you guys want to talk about? Any questions about space flight? I got those links filled. Thank you very much. Thorin at a 75 month there. Admiral at a 56. Rocket guy, what's going on? Hey, I got your message, dude. I just haven't had time to go and read it, but it does look pretty cool from what I can tell. Hmm. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's uh let's roll with it. And then we'll get back into Manor Lords, dude. But yeah, Rocket Guy, uh, I'll let you know. I am interested in that. Yes. Very, very interested. Betty, Betty interested. That should be a good time. Uh, Starship block two app flap. Oh yeah, we and we have to. We have to um, show. I got to show you guys that uh, the mishap. Sorry, my brain didn't brain. How did Starliner end up going? Uh, Starliner scheduled to go on the seventeenth. There, there was a chattering valve. A, a chattering valve on the. Um, give me one second. I got to shut the door. Chattering valve on the second stage that was was that is designed for venting ullage pressure inside of the centaur second stage. The oxygen ullage vent was not working correctly, and that's uh that's not something you want to you want to screw around with, um like ever. That's a bad idea. You don't want to, you don't want to screw around with that. Uh, give me one second. Okay. Yes. Okay. Your fourth of July, Pegster. So who's fourth of July is seven the seventeenth. England? England? No. I don't know. Close-ish. May 17th is Norway's Independence Day. Oh. Very nice. Yeah, I was okay. I was I was I was close. I was close. All right. So I'm gonna save the starship stuff. Ow. I'm gonna save the starship stuff for for the end, obviously. Uh there is there's some stuff here and there. Uh Anybody have a link to the Starship IFT-1 mishap? Like, the full mishap report?
Well, Grunlovstagen. Yeah. Okay, that can go over there. Yeah. Well, there you go, Pexer. Hopefully we get a launch. They're going to replace the valve. Uh, not Everybody says, oh, they're going to replace it out of a... Out of an abundance of caution, da, 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 da. I'm telling you, it's so they don't, so they get a good baseline for their crew flight test. I mean, also, you don't want your centaur stage just collapsing. You don't want your centaur stage just collapsing during a uh, during flight. That would be bad. Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, let's see what we got. This is coming from Christian Davenport here. In a letter to ULA's parent companies, Boeing and Lockheed, the Air Force's Frank Calvelli, hey, Frank Calvelli, how you doing? Says he's concerned with ULA's ability to scale manufacturing of its Vulcan rocket and scale its launch cadence to meet the needs of the Department of Defense. What? Eh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Frank Cavelli used unusually blunt terms to say he was concerned with the development of the Vulcan rocket, which the Pentagon intends to use to launch critical national security payloads, but which has been delayed for years. <laughs> ULA joint venture Boeing and Lockheed Martin this morning. He's a, he's a good, yeah. Sure, it access to space. I'm growing concerned with ULA's ability to scale manufacturing of its Vulcan rocket and scale its launch cadence to meet our needs. Currently, there's military satellite capability sitting on the ground due to Vulcan delays. As the owners of ULA and given manufacturing prowess of Boeing and Lockheed Martin corporations, I recommend that you work together over the next 90 days to complete an independent review of ULA's ability to scale its launch cadence and meet its current contract requirements. ULA has a gigantic uh, contract with the Department of Defense called the National Security Space Launch Phase 2 contract. Um, it's called an LSP, a Launch Services Procurement. Uh, the launch services procurement was awarded to two two providers, two launch providers. One of them gets 60% share of launches. The other one gets 40. You you award it to two providers. So if one if one doesn't break, if one breaks or whatever, the other one can pick up the slack. So NSSL phase two, it's called an LSP, right? Uh, National Security Space Launch, pretty straightforward stuff. Launch services procurement, which is phase two. Phase one was funding the development of vehicles for this. Uh, but anyway, but I digest. So ULA got 60% share from the phase two, uh, NS uh, NSSL phase two, LSP. They got 60% of the launches through 2028 for the Department of Defense. SpaceX got 40. Uh, so that's how, you know, when people ask me, how long, how much longer is Falcon going to be flying? Well, I can tell you it's at least going to be flying until 2028. At the very least, because that's where their launches are manifested out to for the National Security Space Launch. Actually, Phase 3 for launch services procurement for NSSL should be out and about soon, I think. But that's a, another story. So, um, Frank, Cal Frank Calvelli is the Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration. <sighs> hmm... This really isn't surprising, Rocket Guy. Vulcan has been delayed from initial operation, initial operational frequency, and of course they wanted to figure out how long and understand if ULA can deliver. I have no doubt that they can. Uh, guys, okay, all right, this is gonna sound really stupid, but okay, this is a I'm just thinking, thinking. All right, so why would ULA delay Vulcan? Why would that happen? Well, we knew there was some problems with B4. They there were some things with the BE-4 that they wanted to get right. In 2017, there was a major thing that they found wrong with it, and they had to basically retool it, and they've been playing catch-up since. But also, at the same time, Frank Cavelli, his background. What do you... What, what's his background? Hey, Frankie. Frankie. Frank Cavelli. This guy. Where is he from?
He served as principal deputy director of the NRO from 2012 to 2020. And in 2021, he joined Booz Allen Hamilton as an SVP. He served for 30 years in the CIA, okay, where he was assigned to the NRO. Deputy director of the National Reconnaissance Office, Booz Allen Hamilton. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Spying. Got it. Booz Allen Hamilton is in uh we'll say they're a military contractor and call it call it just yeah, we'll we'll just we'll just call it that. Anyway, so here's what I was thinking. Um so Rocket Gun, we know that ULA got that huge block buy from Amazon. ULA has their, you know, 60% phase two launch services procurement, right? But they also, also, they got the single largest block buy of rockets ever, ever from Amazon, which included 38 launches of the Vulcan vehicle, if I'm remembering, if I'm remembering right. So that's yeah, 38 it was 38 launches of Vulcan, like 12 launches of Arian 6 and 12 launches of New Glenn. That was the single largest block buy in the history of commercial space. Amazon Amazon is doing it to build uh their web services uh satellite network called Project Kuiper. Um which Atlas, believe it or not, launched. They also bought nine at nine Atlas Five launches. Just on a side note, um, uh, Atlas had launched the first two Project Hyper demo sats uh, last. No, it was this year. Sorry, the, the rocket launches are all blur nowadays because there's so many of them. Anyway, so uh, my, wh where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? I'd say that. The delays at this point aren't necessarily with anything, but I think they're retooling their production line for scaling, for scalability, to make it to, to, to go a lot faster. I think that's the reason why they're late. I think that's the reason why Vulcan is kind of, you know, moseying along, because they're retooling. Because a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, they went from having, I don't know, 30 launches over the next 10 years to having like 130 launches or something. Not 130, but you get the idea. Their, basic, their, their production output basically needs to double. It needs to double for the most part. That block buy contract for like 30 Vulcan launches, I, I don't know how much it was off the top of my head. It was a, it was a non-insignificant number. Let me put it that way. Or, you know, non-insignificant. You could just say it was a significant number, EJ. Thank, thank you. Grammar. Anyway, moving on. Um, so think about it, dudes. You, you're designed to, you, you have your production line, you have your factory. This is a factory making rockets. Rockets, not a easy thing to manufacture. If, any, if there's any Factorio players out there, you know why. Anyway, uh, now, now instead of producing one rocket a year, now they have to do like three rockets a year. That is a major retool of your of your factory rockets are not a moving assembly line thing they're one-off handmade not handmade but they're they're hand assembled i should say the only people that i know of that are even close to making a moving assembly line for rockets is spacex with starship which is why they seemingly can just crank out more and more starships just it's just like oh there oh look there's another one you know um so why didn't they just buy falcon falcon 9 launches who maverick Astra was trying to scale too. Scaling rockets is one of the, we'll say, components in the tech tree that we need to be able to uh, achieve like low cost dollar amount to space. Yeah, Roger, that is a good point. The RL tens that Centaur uses right now are still handmade. They're moving to an additive manufacturing. Uh, combustion chamber, am amongst other things in the future. Astro is not closed down. They're diversifying. Uh, believe it or not. So, I read that as our spy satellites are actively breaking and we can't launch replacements fast enough, you idiots. Nah, there's always Falcon 9 to be able to pick up the slack. That launch services procurement basically 
the LSP NSSL LSP framework basically takes and takes this kind of stuff into account you can move launches back and forth if needed if a vehicle is late or if it's not working correctly etc cetera, etc cetera. i honestly think the ula is retooling their production line to be able to deal with nssl phase two and project kuiper which does take time that does take time i think that's the reason why however with that being said with that being said i think that ula is actually ahead of the game right now I'm pretty dang sure, and this leads us into the next bit of space news. I'm pretty sure this space news article from Sandra Irwin right here basically says ULA could fly dummy payload on next Vulcan launch if Dream Chaser is delayed. The Pentagon is considering allowing United Launch Alliance to launch a mass simulator on the next Vulcan rocket flight if its planned payload Dream Chaser is not ready by the end of the year. See? I think they're doing that for for certification so they can get it so they could get get the ball rolling which is interesting to me. Amazon, it's kind of silly they wouldn't pay SpaceX when which can pick up the slack for Amazon too. Um Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that makes sense, but I don't... I think they did buy Falcon 9 launches, Maverick, now that I'm thinking about it. But also at the same time, it's... I, I Yeah, it makes more sense to do that, but I, you know, one... Uh, I think bolstering another launch vehicle and building out another rocket production line requires a significant investment, and if that's the way you want to do it, then do it. SpaceX won't order from Amazon. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think I think some shareholder. Yeah, fish. I think that's right. I think some shareholders from from Amazon like sued the company because uh, yeah, f because there's a fiduciary responsibility to save money. Now that you're mentioning it, uh, I vaguely remember that. I think they bought. Yeah, the board complained and they bought three. <laughs> They bought three Falcon 9 launches, so it's kind of funny because that actually is what's going on. SpaceX is their primary competitor. Why would they buy launches from them if they don't have to? Money is money, Raja. Discovery, go at throttle up. Hey, Hotbox, 37 month resub. Money's money, dude. Hey man, there's not very there's not very many ways to diversify your revenue streams when you're in the launch services business. Ask ULA. Uh, so you take every opportunity that you can get. We're not basically from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense to turn down business at this point. That's really, that's a really bad idea. SpaceX has launched one web satellites into space. They've launched obviously Starlink and, and yeah, I, I, personally guys, uh, you know, especially considering the, you know, Quilty space, a space sector marketing and marketing analytics firm basically said that star starlink is going to make six billion dollars of revenue this year guess what i think that's a drop in the bucket for our telecommunications bandwidth uh not bandwidth uh, it's a drop in the bucket for our telecommunications for our thirst for telecommunications and data transfer long story short a lot of people use the internet nowadays. A lot of people use the internet. I think there's room for Project Kuiper. I think there's room for OneWeb. I think there's room for Iridium. Intel sat, Viasat, and Starlink. And the demand is definitely there. It's not like it's not like we've seen a recession in telecommunications. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, case in point, like what you're seeing right here. Hey, I use the internet. Dude, me too. Holy balls. <laughs> Whoa. You're like... You're like the only other person I know predominant that does that. That's crazy. Actually, dude, I can remember a time where these com this conversation actually made sense. Yeah. Yeah, I remember in like the early 2000s when I was but a wee lad going around and, you know, talking to other kids at high school. Bro, you know what the internet is? Dude, dude did you play Halo on GameSpy Tunnel? Hell yeah, you know what the internet is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's definitely a thing. Rhino, what's that? <laughs> yeah.
Rhino, is that is that the internet? You mean the series of tubes? No, no, no. It's like a big truck. I thought you were too young for Game Spy. No, I used the Game Spy tunnel when I was but a wee lad. Yeah, Game Spy tunnel. Get off the computer. I gotta make a phone call. No, Mom, I can't pause. It's online. Rhino, what's this? What did you, you got to hold a meteor? Bro, ho, ho. that's meteorific. <laughs> that's sick, dude. That's awesome. Freaking cool, man. That's a nice ass droid. Yep, online gaming in 1995. I think the first time I played something online was probably either StarCraft or Star Siege Tribes. Probably Star Siege Tribes. Yeah. Yeah, that was like 98 or 99 or something. I got into... I, I got introduced to the internet at a very young age. Can you tell? <laughs> yeah yep mm -hmm. and counter-strike 1.5 i the first counter-strike the first version of counter-strike that i played was a version that you downloaded as a mod for half-life i started playing counter-strike before standalone yeah pre-riot shield free dualies Yeah, that's pretty good, Willie. That works. Anyway. Okay, boom. Shut the heck up. If anything, it, Dave's, it would be Gen X, all right? That's the stuff that Gen X was doing. I was the squeaker in in my, uh, in my the clans for tribes because I was the youngest one there. Oh, day of defeat, Rash. Good call. You first with StarCraft and Star Siege tribes, too? Nice. Nice. Do you know how many cert, cert, cert flights Vulcan must have for the DoD? The, Rocket Guy, that's what I'm not 100% sure from. I always thought that one flight would kind of prove it out. The Astrobotic, uh, the Astrobotic mission, it was perfect insertion, right? I have no clue about these names. Yeah, yeah, Dave. Sorry, I've been on the internet for a long time, man. I thought it was in the NSL con NSSL contract. Two sounds right. Well, considering they're saying, you know, if Dream Chaser isn't ready, launch it with a mass simulator. Rocket Guy, I think I think you're right. When did you get into Counter-Strike? Are you serious? I just told you that a moment ago. But why male models? Anyway. So... Personally, just on a side note, I think that Dream Chaser will be ready. I think that Dream Chaser is just fine. It, actually, here, check this out. They uh, posted a picture of Dream Chaser. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Yes. Mm. Yeah. They're replacing the Valve Sea Kraken, 17th. Dream Chaser is almost done with its acoustic and vibration testing, and it will be once once it once it's out of Plumbrook, once it's out of Ohio, they're gonna send it right to the Cape. Which is uh, pretty poggies. That's pretty poggies right there. Windows 3.11. The first Windows that I used was Windows 95. Yeah. Start me up. Start me up. Don't stop. Brown. Down. 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 Although I do vaguely remember playing, like, racing games on the computer. 
and having to use DOS to change the change the directory to the CD drive. I do vaguely remember that. So Windows 95 might not be right. That might be that might be something else. That might not be Windows 95. Okay, aerodynamic question. Can Vulcan handle wings on top of it? I know it, that changes the center of lift. You're right, T-Man, but Dream Chaser's wings actually fold up like a Navy plane, and it can fit inside the fairing without it. You had to do that for old DOS games in 95. So, yeah, Yarg, it's very possible. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, personally, I think ULA will be able to deliver. I think... I'm not exactly sure why uh why um why the national security guys would get up their tail about it, but I think it'll I think it'll be fine. Atlas Five could manage Dream Chaser without a fairing and folding wings, so I think I should think, yeah, human rating and all. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I played I played games on five and a half floppy, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Big guy about this big. Yeah, I remember those. I played a, there was a racing game that we played on that. Me and my dad played. Anyway. So, yeah, personally, I, I think Vulcan will be ready, guys. I, I don't I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think it'll be ready to go. Anyway, we got a little bit of update from Rocket Lab here. Add this to the queue. Eh? Okay. All right, what do we got here? Blue, the spacecraft on the left has completed successful thermal vacuum testing campaign. Uh, has completed a successful thermal vacuum test campaign. Meanwhile, gold, the spacecraft on the right has completed pre-environments testing and is now on to vibration testing. Not long ago, these beautiful... Not long to go until these beautiful machines are shipped out to the Cape, ready for their journey to Mars. Oh, this, Rocket Lab is making these for NASA's escapade mission. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Escapade. You guys know what escapade's launching on? Those satellites? It's not Electron. It's not Neutron either. New Glenn. So, you can kind of extrapolate... Jeff was the one who declared war. Yeah, you're not wrong, James. You can kind of extrapolate the rough timeline from when these satellites are going to be ready for when we're going to see a new Glenn launch. I contend to say that it's probably this year. I did say maybe the beginning of next year on NSF on Friday, but now I, I thought they were talking about something different, to be honest with you. Whoops. I think Positron, yes. The fact that multiple people answered Positron makes me very happy. Um, but yeah, this if these things are getting ready to go and they're getting ready to be shipped down to the Cape for a launch, I would say that New Glens is probably going to happen sometime in quarter four this year. Satellites do take a little while to make. It's, yeah, just happens. But very, very interesting news nonetheless. So, hey, fellas, can you give me the link to that Starship OFT again, please? The uh, IFT-1 IFT one mishap thing. I keep loading it up on the other computer to get the link, and it keeps downloading it. So I, I need the link to, I need to put it on my main computer so you guys can see it. Or I could just go figure out where it's from. So there was a Freedom of Information Act here about the mishap report from the Integrated Flight Test 1 from IFT-1 for Starship. We're going to pivot over and do uh, into some Starship news now. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find the dang link to it. 
Oh, yeah, here we go. I got it. Ah, uh, there you go. Thanks, Gary. I got to copy that link. All right. So, here we go. Orbital Flight Test 1. Final mishap investigation report. This was, like I said, this was Freedom of Information Acted. So, let's take a look. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I think I saw something. Okay, uh, I, I knew that was blanked out, but I didn't think it was that blanked out. Shortly after liftoff, video evidence indicates that a significant structural failure on the launch pad deck foundation occurred. This failure has resulted in bulk soil displacement below and around the launch mount, sending a considerable amount of sand and debris into the air. As the vehicle continued on its flight path, it successfully cleared the launch tower and proceeded downrange. This rule violation resulted in the firing of the autonomous flight safety system, destruct command on both Super Heavy and Starship's independent AFSS. All four destruct charges, two on each vehicle, successfully fired, and all four main tanks were successfully opened as a result. The Starship Super Heavy program is focused on a new launch vehicle to still in the early stages of development by SpaceX. With the exception of the AFSS... AF... With the exception of the AFSS system, the Autonomous Flight Safety System system, okay, and Starship software, the Starship program does not yet, yet use SpaceX standard processes for design, build, and mission assurance. Starship Orbital Flight Test 1 was launched under the FAA commercial... The vehicle suffered engine... Several engine and vehicle system failures resulting in emission rules violation at 1336-16 UTC triggering the autom automated flight termination system. The vehicle exploded The vehicle exploded midair and was lost. After the mishap, SpaceX initiated investigation. They built it in Boca Chica. Prototype had previously gone through a series of pre-flight operations. Super Heavy is comprised of two... Starship Super Heavy is comprised of two stages... An overview of the diagram is shown in figure one. Unless otherwise speci specified, all event time references in this report are relative to booster seven t minus time equals zero and denoted as t plus or minus, which is deterministic for a flight software command for flight software commands and correspond to the initiation of the quick disconnect retraction sequence. T minus zero corresponds to 23... To April 20th, 2023 at 1333.09 UTC. Uh-huh. And that's...
That's it. One of the more visual observations associated with uh, Orbital Test Flight 1 was the damage to the pad deck under the launch mount. They didn't even show a picture of it being damaged. As a result of the lessons learned from Orbital Flight Test 1, SpaceX has redesigned the pad deck and foundation. Yeah, uh, yeah we didn't notice. Oh, here's more text. The investigation finds that orbital flight test one mishap was caused by fires and detonations in Booster 7's outer engine bays, resulting in aft, aft end fires leading to loss of communication with the majority of the thrust vector co control actuators, leading to an inability to control the vehicle. This resulted in a vehicle turn and tumble. Violation of the Chevron 7 rule and initiation of the vehicle's flight safety system terminating the flight. The vehicle's AFS The vehicle's AFSS system was activated in unexpectedly unexpe unexpected and unacceptably large delay between vehicle destruct charges firing and vehicle demise was observed. Root cause of this failure was design and test shortcomings of the system and corrected actions have been implemented. The system system That's it. Okay. Great read. Learned a lot. Okay. All right. That's that. Yep. Next. Super heavy booster for flight four is moving to the pad. This is coming from SpaceX themselves. Thanks. Freedom of information act. Very cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. Geek. I'd be curious to see how much of that is ITAR and how much of it is, um, how much of it is ITAR and how much of it is SpaceX pro redacting proprietary information. I'm, I bet you it's a combination of those things. Hmm. Meanwhile. Woof. Woof. Oh, that's a lot of boosters. Oh, look, guys, the internet. <laughs> Tubes. Tubes. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but... And I I don't I don't mean this to I don't mean this to be a dick, but I'm you know what I'm gonna go there today. I chose violence today. There's more super heavy boosters in this picture than SLS course in existence. Yep, there I said it. Not sorry. Tuba, indeed. Yeah. Now there shouldn't be, but here we are. Yep, there shouldn't be. There, there, there. That's not how this should this should be at all. But you know, but are these finished boosters? Uh, probably not, Rocket Guy. But uh, dude, if we compared unfinished to unfinished, is there still four SLS cores in existence? I'll even count Artemis One. So we had what two test two testing articles. Right? So you had your structural testing article, you had your conf welding confidence test article, you had Artemis 1 core, Artemis 2 core, Artemis 3 core. 
and then a potential for an Artemis four core that's made out of leftover parts from the welding confidence article because they screwed up the welds. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that I think that that needs to change. I think that that needs to not be like that. It's not Boeing fish. I'm telling you right now, it's not them. It's just the overall integrated, the programmatic architecture of the SLS program is stupid. And it's, I've been saying that for years. It's not, it's not comprehensive enough. It's nowhere near. But, you know, that's what happens when you refuse to give them money. You know what I mean? And I know what people are going to say, what do you mean? Do you want to give Boeing more money? No, no, no. I want to give the program more money. Yeah. I want to give the program more money. It's... But, you know, now is not the time to do that, to be honest with you. You know, that ship kind of sailed already. The time to give them money was 10 years ago. <laughs> but anyway. Anyway, really great pictures. Yeah, baby. Let's freaking go. Boop. 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 All right. So, that's good that they're rolling out stuff. Here, Ship 31 was being tested. This is coming from our buddies over at NSF. Hey, Ghost Rider, 25-month resub. Ship 31 was being tested. This is coming from our buddies over at NSF. And uh, they were testing it this, well, yesterday. And um, I don't know. You guys tell me. You think something went wrong? Just watch, like, right up right up in there. I, um, I don't think that's supposed to do that. Yeah, I don't, I'm pretty sure that's not supposed to do that. Uh... Yeah, that's definitely an electrical fire. We need to, we've had an anomaly? We gotta secure the area? Monster fish? I don't know, not relevant. Not relevant. Anyway. Yeah, that, uh, that's not ideal. Um, that looks like some type of electrical fire. Now, I had kind of theorized that it looks like an animal, like a bird flew into it or something. Because you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have exposed wires there like that. That's not... That's, I mean, maybe during testing, but also, uh, but also I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's, yeah. Uh. Now keep in mind, ship 31 isn't the next one that's in line to fly. Uh, so that's not going to delay the next launch. Um, but also it, yeah, probably, probably not, probably not good. Yeah, the, the, yeah, that's, that, uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's not supposed to do that. It, it's some type of electrical fire, definitely damaged something. Uh, I have no idea what it damaged, but it's something on the raceway for sure. Uh, now, with that being said, uh, let's see. Elon said that the next one, the next Starship flight should be in about three to five weeks. So that's targeting kind of, uh, first or second week of June. Uh, I'm trying to find the actual tweet arena. Looking through Elon's tweets and replies. Section nowadays is a is a little bit of a chore, to say the least. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not about space in here. Um, not 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 a comment one way or the other about the other stuff that's in here. It's just when you're running a space news segment and trying to look for stuff that has to do with space. It's uh, there's a lot of stuff here that's not that, but that's okay. That's okay. I am trying to find it. Here it is. I got it. I got it. I got it, bros. Here we go. 
Yeah, there we go. That used to be a lot easier. Uh, I don't know if I can. I just want to play the game. I'll figure out what it is when I have a good enough grasp on the game. Probably three to five weeks. That was on the 11th, so that was a couple of days ago. Objective is for the ship to get past max heating or at least further than last time. There you go. Still nothing about booster recovery, though. That's not true at all. Uh, flight 4 will do another simulated landing, just like Flight 3 was attempting to do. And if Flight 4 does succeed in its test flight objectives, basically do the simulated catch and landing at sea, it um, they will attempt to catch on Flight 5. I've, you know, and I know what people are going to say. Why catch this thing so early? What What do you mean? What if you blow up the pad? Well, first of all, we we have road closures for them to start construction. Well, not start construction. There were road closures for moving tower segments around. <clears throat> Boca Chica. Moving tower segments around. I don't think they're moving those tower segments around for their health. I think that SpaceX is going to start construction on a second orbital launch pad uh, at Boca Chica. They're going to make a twin pad complex. How that's going to work, where it's going to go, I don't know. I have my theories. I'd say it's going to go where suborbital pad B is, most likely, uh, but could could go anywhere. Um, I kind of wish they were right next to each other. That would be super cool, but, you know, it's all good. Can you imagine getting long-range footage of that massive massive booster entering a hover? I know, Rocket Guy. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Um, is there a picture from RGV, Phil? What, what do you got? What do you got for me? Join us in Starbase. This is coming from RGV Aerial. Join us in Starbase Weekly Live for launch site discussion. Here's a photo of the future foundations and the second launch pad. All right, what do we got here? Once again, this this footage is coming from RGV Aerial. He goes out and flies, flies around. Go go give him a follow. Great pictures. If you don't want to hear my cruddy analysis on it, just go look at it for yourself. Uh, I will post the link to this in chat. Go give that guy a follow. RGV is cool. He's a good dude. I don't know the guy personally, but I know a guy who knows a guy who went to the who went to the doctor once. Yep, lots of grading going on here. Lots of grading. Uh, yeah, lots of grading. Pad B has already pretty much been disassembled. Yeah, this picture's from when Ship 30 was doing testing on B. They static fired it. Let's see, what do we got? Anything cool down there? Okay. Bulldozer, bulldozer, excavator, excavator, dump truck, dump truck, bulldozer. Ties, crane ties, compactors or steamrollers, another excavator, some trucks. You got a front end loader right there, two telehandlers, three telehandlers. I'm not sure what that thing is. Uh, and then over here, you have another telehandler in the semi truck. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, this is a. Uh... They're grading stuff. This is all this is all grading equipment. So they're 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 dumping dirt and grading this out here, uh, making it nice and flat, getting ready to build something on it. There is also a pile driver right here. Interesting pile driver and a telescoping crane, a roller a, a track telescoping crane. Uh, so a crawler telescoping crane is what that is. There's two cement mixers right there, three, four cement mixers right there. They're pouring a lot of concrete. Pile drivers there, though, with stuff, with uh, rebar here. So when you're drilling pilings like this, you need something that you, you basically, it's basically a support for whatever's going on top of it. And that support is either A, something heavy, or B, something tall. Um, in this case, I, I have a feeling it might be both of those things. Don't ask me why. I don't know. It's just, you can tell because of the way it is. So, <clears throat> actually, that could be an auger, to be honest with you, fellas. It could be an auger. 
uh, an auger blade to to make a big hole in the ground and, and basically you you drill a gigantic hole in the ground and water fills in that hole and then you pour concrete into you pour concrete in as a slurry mixture and then you drop you drop the lattice in there uh, you can tell it's an aspen because of the way it is that's pretty neat this might be for the tower judging by these rebars the rebar and the pilings uh, I would guess that that's probably where the tower is going to end up. So, because the, those don't, that does not necessarily look like the auger, the piece of auger equipment that, uh, that doesn't look like the piece of auger equipment that we saw drill out the pilings for the, for the OLM. How neat is that? That's pretty neat. Here's the weekly from NSF. Uh, I don't, I don't want to watch that that here that i mean there's jack doing his thing i don't want i don't i don't know if we want to watch that here uh because i want to i want to make sure you guys are supporting our buddies over at nsf i like jack jack's cool it's a good dude he he gets a, he gets a lot of my movie references on nsf live which is on fridays at 5 p.m eastern i like jack jack's a good dude go go support him over there so the tank farm will be over where the crane ties are I don't know. The OLM had way, yeah, way bigger rebar lattice right there. So will they need to construct more tank farm towers or just use the existing ones for both? Yeah, I don't know, dude. I don't have that answer. I, I'm trying to make out, like, what... Okay, so... Something will move smiley face. Okay. So Rocket Guy, we gotta Like let's let's uh ignore goalie's cryptic messages that we just generally don't understand. But um let me think about this for a second. So look where they're grading. They're grading all up in here. Let's uh let's jump into Google Earth. For an eventual flight cadence, I assume two is better, but the but is there anything being showed being developed for the tank farm equipment? Not sure. They also demolished the berm separating pad B and the tank farm. Okay. Uh, that's the build site over here. Okay. So taking a look at RGV's picture here. Let's take a look. Whoa. Whoa, that's a lot of that's a lot of real estate. So that is all that right there. Um so we started to see them drill pilings basically right here. Uh that's here, let me just line up the camera angles from RGV shot. His is more centered over here. So there's the three water tanks right there. So right here is where they started drilling pilings. And you said, you guys said they took out the berm right there, which is right here. I'm thinking, I'm thinking what would be the right orientation and everything. Uh, if the tower is going right here, dude, I'm going to guess the OLM is probably going right there. And I'm going to guess that there's going to be a tank farm back here. Why? Well, why do I think that? Um, this is already compacted soil to an extent right here. So I think they're going to put the tank farm, which does take up a good amount of space here. That's the, that's like what's left of the original one right there and then then more um i think it's gonna go right here i think they're gonna do a second tank farm right here this is gonna go 
right right up in there and it's going to go on top of the where they already have it and they're probably going to reuse these all these tanks that are right here um and then yeah just looking at rgb's picture tower should be oriented for catch james mm. I think they're too far away. Well, not too far away, but you guys got to remember they're using fully cryogenic propellants. Fully cryogenic propellants pumping it pumping it over that distance, you're going to you're going to lose a lot to boil off. Uh I mean it can be done, sure. Of course it could. But I think it'd be easier to just put another one right here. Especially since we've seen plans from SpaceX in the past call for two tank farms and two for two launch pads. I think that's my driving thing. My driving thing behind why I think they're doing it that way. Um, let me look at the orientation for the other tower. Yeah. Yeah, here. Let me bring up the... Let me bring up the line tool here. Um, I think it's just going to be like this. There's just going to be another tower. Right there is where they're drilling pilings. And then I think the I think they're gonna put actually. You know, somebody said this during NSF Live, and I didn't pay it any mind because I was like, no, 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 no. But uh yeah, this kind of lines up with the other OLM being pretty much exactly where pad B is. Like the this footage was taken from the side. It's not perfect iso I isometry right here, but let's try to get approximate from the center of the tower to approximate center of the OLM. It's about 100, 100 feet, 110 feet, so about 30 meters. Um, and if we saw from that RGV picture that the pad, or the tower, we think the tower is going to go basically right here, that would mean that that would clock the OLM somewhere over here somewhere. Uh, and they did take out the berm. So let's just... Oh... Uh. Yeah. This is coming from NSF Pad B demolitions. Oh, no. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. I don't like that at all. No. It's just. <laughs> Okay. I guess they didn't want that umbilical there anymore. But once again, that isn't anything that we didn't know. It just it's just weird seeing stuff demolished. But whatever. I don't get I don't I don't let that occupy my headspace too much. You know why? Because a bigger and better one's gonna be built in its place. So if the tower is gonna be right around here, that would put our OLM right in this area here. Guys, just an idle observation. If the OLM, if the o, if the orbital launch mount, if orbital launch mount B ends up right here, that pretty much puts this commodity line, so the propellant propellant transfer lines from the farm, that puts that one pretty much exactly clocked on the leg where they put where where the uh, quick disconnect is. So, like, look, see the see the uh, OLM orbital launch mount quick disconnect. This thing, that's the basically the, the fuel lines, fuel and oxidizer lines for super heavy. It's lined up with a cardinal direction of the tower. It's the closest to the tower, which uh, the fuel lines, if you look, now you can't really see the towers in the way in this picture, but the fuel lines come this way. Like that. They do they do that. They're underground, obviously. You don't you don't need those getting wrecked. Um, we know that because the deluge system goes around it. It goes, uh, just here, bear with me. The deluge system goes here. Like that. See what I'm talking about? So they go, they, they go around each other. So the, the, the lines are coming through here. They're coming through over here and they turn. And that leg right there is the one that fuel and oxidizer go up, right? So if that line's coming through here like this, it goes 
up that, and then it goes over here, and then it goes up into the QD, if I'm remembering right, like that, right? So, just an idle observation is that if we're about 110 feet away from, I mean, let's center point that. If they're drilling pilings right here, just next to these three water tanks, and it, if we take into account that the pad's going to be oriented basically in this, hold on, hold on, let me look. I think we can see the pilings. Nah, you can't see it. There's just, I thought those were pilings, but those are just three dudes and a bulldozer. <laughs> I thought it was. It's a tiny bulldozer, but it's there. So, if the tower is going to go right here, that could put the OLM this way. But if the tower is going to go right there, and the OLM ends up basically right where my mouse cursor is, that lines those commodity lines up pretty pretty much perfectly. The fuel fuel and oxidizer lines. Have we seen any evidence of them ripping this thing out? Because if they aren't, SpaceX probably is just going to expand this tank farm. See what I mean? It kind of lines up, right? So if the tower is basically right here... Basically right... No, well, is it... Is it behind it? No, it's a little ways behind. The tower is going to go right there. That would put the OLM right here. Yeah, I don't know, man. They might clean slate it. It's, I, I thought it, it looked like it lined up, but it doesn't line up. But then again, perspectives and, and whatnot. Which begs the question, dudes, what the heck is SpaceX going to do with this area right here? Just, what do you think? Like, I'm actually kind of curious. I mean, if the if the other pad is going to go over here, I mean, first of all, you got to launch, you got to launch over one pad to get past the other one. That's second parking garage, my guy. A pool for employees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Geek, they're... Judging by the amount of grading going on here, they might be wiping the slate clean. Most of it is tank farm already. It's got exp It's been expanded since this shot. Yeah, RGB is a picture of a lot of trucks. Flaps. <laughs> nice. Here, let's, uh, you know what? Let's do this. See what our buddies are over here are up to. A lot more tanks to come, okay? Thanks for that. Oh yeah, by the way, boosters stacked and Starship is on the chopsticks. Just thought I'd let you know. That's what's left of pad B right there. Wouldn't a super heavy refurbishing facility make sense there? I don't think they want to refurbish super heavy raid, and I think the whole stakeholder expectation is that it just you landed and it's good to go again. Nothing, John. Nothing on the horizon. Uh, we're still a little ways out. We we haven't seen an integrated test, integrated like wet dress from these two vehicles like together yet. So we'll see. There's going to need to be a building for payload integration at some point, though. I agree. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, Raiden, super heavy. Yeah, okay, what you were saying makes a lot more sense, yeah. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know if I'd put the buildings that freaking close. Payload integration does kind of make a little bit more sense, but, yeah, I don't know. You know what would really make me happy? If they made it uniform. If they basically duplicated this and just put it over here. That would make me very happy. 
I don't know about you guys. I like looking at twin pads. They out here doing launch complex city builder. Yep. See, I, I, I need to see more stuff like this. Copy and paste. Yeah, not mirror. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to see more of this and more of this and more of that. You know what I'm talking about? And more of that. Yeah, you know what I mean? That would, that would probably be a good idea. We should probably do that. Massive two pads. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is also nice. What's that a picture of? Where do you put the deluge? That's a good... Yeah, I'm not sure, man. That's a good question. Starbase Weekly is starting in five minutes. Uh, yeah. There's... Whoa. Whoa, dude. Look at the trench at Massey's. Holy cow. That's, that's cool. That's impressive. Hey, nice X. So that's actually over here a little way. So there's the launch site. There's the build site. And SpaceX has a testing site right here. Yeah, that trench is right here in this picture. It's not, it's not there yet. They built that thing real quick. Yeah. I firmly believe that 26 is going to be used for testing this whole thing out. I don't think they need 26 anymore. And I, I think it's going to be used to test the test stand, believe it or not, if that if that makes any sense, dude. So the reason why we call this Massey's, just in case anybody was wondering, uh, is um, this is, uh, it was a gun range called Massey's Gun Range. Gun range. Like, if we go back a little ways... I said if we go back a little ways. There we go. Yeah, see, gun range. Cool. The ULA sniper would love that place. And then SpaceX was like, hey, I'll, we'll pay you money for that. And the guy's like, how much? And they're like, <laughs> and he's like, oh, all right, cool. How much? <laughs> Let's just say they vacated. That guy vacated real quick. <laughs> that, guy, that guy was like, oh, yeah? Uh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll go make a gun range somewhere else. Yeah, you're good. All right, see you later. You were, you were serious, though, right? Yep. All right, cool. See you. Bye. <laughs> Toss me the keys and split. <laughs> Reject the first offer? Yeah, maybe. Maybe he did. And they kept the name. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Massey's Test Site. It's pretty sweet, dude. That's a pretty poggies. Hey, what's going on right here? What's this? Huh. I never noticed this channel right here. What's that about? That's definitely human made. It's too straight to be natural. A gun range in Texas? Well, there's one less, but the guy probably went and built a bigger one somewhere else. See, I always like to look around and look for infrastructure around here that's being built. Now, we might not see anything crazy here, like, uh, yeah, you might not see anything too nutty over here because these pictures are a year ago. 
they're from a year ago. These pictures are from June 25th of last year. So let's be real. The tents are still there. The tents haven't been there in a long time. Uh, first of all. Second of all, uh, yeah, a year ago in SpaceX time is... Might as well be 10 years ago for everybody else. Yeah, it'd be nice to get some updated pictures here. Yep, that's the... That's the uh, closest one. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, Harry can get them. That's right. Here, let's see. Let's see if Harry has, Harry's got anything. I know he's got some pictures of the drone ship. So Harry has, uh, for whatever reason, has access to some uh, optical, uh, some op op optical observation saddle. Oh my God! Look at the SAR. So just read the instructions. One of SpaceX's drone ships was in the Bahamas in in Freeport in a dry dock. Interestingly enough. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, Harry Harry knows. Harry knows people. Let's he has people skills. He's good at dealing with people. Oh, they moved JRDI out of the dry dock. Or no, they moved it into the dry dock. It's sitting just read the instructions. One of the drone ships is in the dry dock. There he's got some pictures of that looked like Baikonur. Yep, that's definitely Baikonur. Okay. Huh. The rocket garden, and you can. Oh uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Huge building. One small note here: this satellite picture is a few days old, and things move so fast in Starbase. So consider that when looking at them. But either way, this is a great vantage point to understand the footprint of the parking garage. Footprint of the park. What our shipyards aren't good enough for Elon, John. He may have gone to a dry dock in Freeport because it was. They may have gone there because it was the closest. Yeah. Yeah, it's the closest garage next to the rocket garden and you can see that it's quite a huge building one small note here this satellite picture is a few days old and things move so fast in starbase so consider so they like dude they don't they don't usually outfit the they don't usually outfit the drone ships at freeport um they're usually done somewhere in louisiana uh or somewhere on the gulf coast because there's a huge shipbuilding industry there it's not it's not the not the cool shipbuilding industry right but it's, it's still pretty cool um, that's usually where they do it. Uh, I've, I don't, I don't ever remember in recent memory, one of those things like a drone ship, get, like get it going down for service in the Bahamas. I don't remember that. So that tells me that just read the instructions might be a little worse for the wear because, you know, having rockets land on the deck doesn't do good things to the ship. Either that or maybe it got damaged in rough seas. Who knows? So Jack was did was Jack saying there's a parking garage right here? Hold on. Yak, talk to me. Footprint of the parking garage next to the rocket garden and you can see that it's quite a huge building. One small note here. This satellite picture is a few days old and things move so fast in Starbase. So consider that when looking at them. But either way, this is a great vantage point to understand the footprint of the parking garage. Now they build cool ships on the Gulf Coast. Check out Ingalls Shipbuilding. Yeah, I, I I know. If I if I said they build cool ships there, you would have said no. They build cool ships where I'm from. You know how I know because Lundprod said it. No matter what. Hey, guess where he's from? Guess where he's from? He might be from the same place that you're from. Weird, right? Yeah, that's weird. Anyway, jeez, that's strange. That's strange. I know about Ingalls, you dope. Anyway, yeah, still pretty cool. Yeah, Ingalls build some cool stuff. I, I don't hate them either. It's over halfway up, four levels. Wait, what? Wait, when was this picture taken? This was last week. Last week. What? What? It is it?
Hmm. Yeah, this, this is nice. Next to the rocket garden, and you can see that it's quite a huge building. One small note here, this satellite picture is a few days old, and things move so fast in Starbase, so consider that when looking at them. But either way, this is a great vantage point to understand the footprint of the park. Wow. That's impressive. That's, uh... Eh, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty neat. I knew Jack Byer would eventually come around. This is the producer. Kevin produces NSF. You know, I'll give him a follow. He's all right. He, for a Yankees fan. I knew that Jack Byer would eventually come around. Ship 26 fan club. Michael wrong. <laughs> I, I already saw you and say that. Kevin Michael wrong. <laughs> That's pretty funny, dude. All right, what, is, what did Yak say in this? Yak? Let's start with the most controversial of all of them, Ship 26. I know, I know, I said to boo Ship 26, and then it was bad, and then I was the founder of the Ship 26 hate club, but I'm starting to think that Kevin Michael Reed, our live stream producer, might be right. Let's start with the most I am a bit disappointed and if it's one thing I do not like to be. It is to be disappointed. I know. <clears throat> Kevin Michael wrong. We got an RGB picture. What are these? Oh, yeah. Oh, dude. You know, it'd be nice if these loaded. L146 is scheduled to launch on a Falcon 9 on May 19th. Cool. Oh, yeah, baby. Not one or two or three, but four. Four stones. Goalie, I know you're out there. I'm sorry, man. That's the coolest crane around. Oh, hell yeah, dude. That thing is sick. Fight you? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll fight you. If you could get up here and fly to us, but you can't, son. We'll just fly away. Oh, that's sick. What a cool helicopter. My favorite part about Sky Cranes is that the guts are hanging out on the top. Like, there's no fairings, there's no armor or anything. Like, dude, that's straight up the gearbox right there. You can just see it. The drive shaft that's go that goes to the tail rotor, see it? That That's the drive shaft that spins the tail rotor. You see, there's a gearbox there, there's a tail rotor gearbox. It's just hanging off the top. That's awesome. It's so freaking cool, man. What a cool freaking vehicle. Oh, that's so killer, dude. Tell us about Pratt & Whitney engine since Jack stopped himself in the NSF video. Pratt & Whitney? To save all the weight, yeah. I mean, Rocket Guy, like you, when you think about it, dude, you got two big honking turbo shafts right there. Big honking turbo shafts. I, I, I believe this is this mechanism is borrowed from like an S61 or something. I think it's an S61. So the Sky Crane, that's what the Sky Crane looks like when it has all of its clothes on. See, that's what it's that's what it looks like. But the Sky Crane is is full on naked. Not naked, naked. Differences. Okay. This is the coolest crane ever? Wrong. Well that <laughs> coolest crane on this planet, W. See? 
that's the same drive mechanism, if I'm remembering right. But you got one, two, three, four, five. So you got a six blade mechanism. That's uh, not. Um, that's not uh, weak. The more so, okay. This isn't always necessarily the case, but the more blades you have, generally means you you have more power behind them. Because, okay, little bit little bit on helicopters. Here you go. Uh, that's more rotating mass, uh, particularly. Obviously, you have more rotating mass, but also those blades take a lot of torque to move because the, uh, more blades and bigger blades have higher moment. And trying to trying to move those things, trying to have them cut through the air at high high ish speed when you're pulling something or t towing something, I guess, or craning something. Uh, that's yeah, that's a lot of power. Those there, this thing makes a ton of power. I mean, it's, it lifts up heavy stuff. Like you already knew that, but good way to tell is you you know you see two you see twin twin turbo shafts right, and you see a lot of blades, heavy lift all day. All day. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, I'll well, give you another example of something else that can lift a lot of things. Look at how big those blades are. There's six of them, but there's just, there's two, there's three on each rotor. Three on two rotors. That should tell you everything you need to know about how, what that thing can lift up. Yep, another good example would be a mil 26. See that? Twin turbo shafts and eight blades. That thing is chunky. Chunky. Another good example is a CH-53. You guys are saying that. I see that. Yep, that chunky. Very chunky. CH-53s are very chunky. Guys, that thing, that thing is as big as a city bus. Like, easily that big like think like no, not not like a you know like a small bus that's used for short distances think like one of those buses that you like a greyhound bus that that's how big that thing is yeah that's right mh53s have three engines yes that is absolutely right they said they needed more oomph so they just mounted one on the back asymmetrically might i add yep chunkier than ej after a week of buckies yeah 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 bonehead last ever want wanted to need a crowbar to poo again watch a tunix engine become unsynced what a mess oh um that's a weird way to say that first part but all right yeah i've seen that video many times i've shown you that video on here before towards sikorsky a while ago they the 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 they use amazing equipment to make that that hub and rotor assembly. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. It's a beast, man. Beast mode. Yeah. So the sky crane, the sky crane's got some got some kick behind it. That thing can move stuff. A lot of stuff. Now, what did Jack? What was Jack saying about the motors? I, I don't I don't understand. Yeah, see, dude, it's just got all the guts hanging out there. Man, that's so cool. Sky cranes are awesome. That's vapor on the rotors. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, Psycho. Yeah, that happens in certain that usually well, that I was I was about to say that usually happens in certain atmospheric conditions. It happens because it's humid. Yeah. It's the pressure differential generated from the vortex on the end of the blade. Yeah, it creates a swirl, creates a little swirly boy off the end of the blade because the air kind of shoots off the side. That, yeah, on a helicopter in this particular scenario, that happens because the blade's spinning, and the blade, the air doesn't always move perfectly perpendicular over the blade. So, like, if this is your blade and incoming air is coming this way, like, say this, this is your laminar flow, right? It doesn't always flow over the blade perfectly like that, right? Sometimes it goes this way. It, it would it would go out. It would actually sometimes the thing cuts through the air and it shoots it off to the side. It doesn't go completely back. What that ends up doing is that uh, on the very edge of the blade, right? On the very edge of the blade. Uh, let me let me zoom in a little ways. 
on the on the blade tip right you see that there's that there's that yellow thing right there so the blade obviously has a bunch of high pressure underneath it why because it's it's used to be it's used it's being used to lift stuff right so it's a, it's basically spinning a wing around right so there's high pressure underneath it and low pressure on the top right when some of that high pressure gets shot off to the side it's it combines with that low pressure off the end of the blade and when that happens they kind of swirl around and it creates differential pressure that can create that vortex right there. See that? It's very cool because in Jack's shot, you can see the guy adjusting the cyclic from the uh, from the uh, trail. From the basically the trail that that blade is making, you can see the cyclic adjustment, which is really cool. See how that line isn't perfectly circular? That's because the guy's moving the flight stick around. Now, on a helicopter, it's not called a flight stick. It's called a cyclic. Why? Because it cycles the pitch on the blades as opposed to a collective. Collective collectively pitches up all the blades. So if all the blades do this all at the same time, that's what you're using with your right hand on a helicopter. If you want to basically make the helicopter do this or this, you're using the joystick, right? Which is a cyclic. Cyclic, ah, be quiet. Be quiet. South Texas, humid, weird, right? Yep, Kurt. Yeah, we got. Yep, we got some wake turbulence there. Yep, yep. That actually brings up a question. Okay, if airplanes have those vortices, vortexes, the little spikes on the end of the wing to reduce them, why don't helicopters have them? Think about it. Why wouldn't they? That's right, Gil, exactly. The low pressure and high pressure, when they combine, they like to yin and yang themselves like this. They like to swirl. That's what a vortex is. Rotational G-forces. It's the moment on the blades, Flyk, and you don't want to generate too much load on the blades. Your rotor assembly will... Blades need to be as light as possible. There are ways to get... On modern-ish helicopters, there are ways to kind of negate that, but also, yeah, they they're, they're, they haven't done like a, a perfect like four uh, winglet up the end of it. But if we look at like a UH-60 or something, the way to get around that for the helicopters is just a little bit different. Um, the blades on the ends are actually bent; they're bent backwards. If that makes any sense. Um, let me see if I can find a picture. Here we go. I mean, keep in mind, this is a model, but it's good enough. See, they, they bend out the end of the blades. See that? That mitigates that, but you don't want to put a big winglet up here. That's too much, that's too much stuff to, to move around. Think about it. You had a, you have a winglet up on the end of that thing. It's going to make the thing do, it's, it's, it's just more weight. Think about like, or more mass to move. Think about like if you had a rope, right? And you had, I don't know, a uh, uh, five pound weight on the end and you did this, right? You could swirl, you could swirl around pretty good, right? Now, now swap that five pound weight out for a 10 pound weight and do the same thing. It's, you're not going to get the same, same thing going on. That, that weight swinging around has way more moment. That, that's more power. That's more, um, you need more torque. You need bigger engines to turn that whole freaking thing. You want to minimize blade mass, not maximize it. So if I had to guess, the reason why the reason why they haven't just put winglets up on the end of these things is because it's too much too much mass, too much moment of inertia. The blades need to be light. That's just more crap to move. The 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 vortex effects that come off the end of these things probably is mitigatable. But it's probably mitigatable by doing something like that instead of putting like a whole winglet on the end of this thing. Primary reason is because the helicopter blade pitches due to different angles of attack. So a winglet can't be effectively designed for it. There you go. That's a bet. Yeah, you know what, wrong guy? That's a better answer than mine. Even though moment moment on the blades is definitely something you have to take into account. Blade blade moment. Yeah, that's Yeah. Blade moment and rotor stall.
Figured that, out, figured that one out the hard way, designing helicopters in Kerbal. Yeah. Are they made of something special? Something super light? Yeah, it's not that big, Fleck, and not as big as you'd see on the wings on an airplane, for sure. But yeah, there you go. Pretty cool. Good questions, dude. Got some little swirly boys coming off the side. Yeah, that's a little tiny vortex. It's... Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Hang on. How much, uh... Ooh, 101st. Cool. What kind of engines does this sucker have? T-73 P-700. Holy balls. Yeah, no wonder that thing lifts things. Yeah, they make 4,800 shaft horsepower. 4,800, 4, and there's two of them. There's, there's two of them. Okay. Yeah, 3,600 kilowatts per, per turbo shaft. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, that's why that's why that thing can do that. That's why that thing lifts things. Uh, wow, that's impressive, dude. It's based on the JT12 small turbo jet. Yeah, what was the JT12 in? Oh, a saber liner. What? <laughs> nice. That's cool. That's a sa it's a saber liner. That's a saber liner engine. That's pretty neat. Yeah, the Jetstar. Lockheed built a private jet a little while ago. Jet stars are cool. Look at that. <laughs> it got four engines. They got four of those things in it. Alright. Okay. Yeah. Lockheed. It goes fast. I, that could, you know what, dude? That could just be, that could just be Lockheed's logo. We're Lockheed Martin. It goes fast. That's it. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's all you need to know. Any interest in doing DCS when the F4 comes out? Yeah, yeah, we'll be doing that. I love F4s. Yeah, it goes fast. We're Lockheed. It goes fast. Of course it goes fast. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's so cool. These pictures from Jack are fantastic, dude. All right, what's the other ones? Ah, uh, here's an RGV picture. Holy buckets. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. Goal, you were saying prefab segments. Yep, that's definitely all prefabricated. And they got a lattice crawler. There's a there's two lattice crawlers sitting there. A lattice crawler with uh, short boom, twin jibs, and then a boom extension. With one with a mass, no jib. Okay, if that made no sense to you, so first of all, cranes borrow, borrow terms from sailing. So if you heard jib mast, see this little thing sticking out? That's a jib. There's two of them. If you see two of them, like rabbit ears off the back of the crane, twin jibs. So when you have a lattice crawler crane like this with a short short boom and then a long boom extension with twin jibs and a lot of counterweight. That means it's moving heavy things. Moving heavy things short distances. Yeah, this one over here is just a straight long boom with the mast. That's uh, that's moving not so heavy things high up. The cranes are reconfigurable. They're like an erector set. You can just change them. That's what a lattice crane means. Uh, as opposed to a telescoping crane. If we go back and look at this uh, RGV picture, right? There's a lattice crane right there. See? Lattice crane, twin jibs. I like the cut of those jibs. Yeah, that has a single jib. So that's designed for moving something pretty heavy pretty high. This thing is designed for something moving something pretty heavy pretty far. Does that make sense? 
like reaching up over a parking garage, like what it's doing. What's the name you mentioned a while ago? I don't... I don't know. Yes. Fan. You, go, you keep saying fan, implying that I can know when you're timed up with the stream. It's, it's, not, it's not Alan, it's Steve. Steve! 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 <laughs> Alan! Derek! I'm enjoying a treat, Derek! Jib. Flub. Yeah, see? See, what, if you look, the lattice pieces are different colors. It looks like Skittles up in here. Because lattice cranes are interchangeable parts. You can you can just reconfigure them for a thousand different freaking things. See? Uh, is there a telescoping crane in here? Nope, there's another lattice over there. Yeah. Uh, just a boom and a mast. The part between the boom and the jib. This thing right here? The fan? That that sucker? Is that what you call that? It's called the fan? The flame trench. Yes! Whatever became of the production site at KSC, Roberts Road, uh, they built the building and then they're... They're going to use Boca Chica for all the research and development. Jim, Roberts Road is really going to come and come and do its own when Starship gets to the operational status. So, Anyway, yeah, these lattice cranes are super cool. They also build our entire civilization. Our civilization runs on lattice cranes. That's why they're cool. That's why I like them. Actually, what else is going on in this RGV picture? Hey, Starship nerds, what's this? What's going on over here? I haven't seen this building and I've been I haven't brushed up in a long time. It's an office building? Oh. I thought it'd be something cool. Never mind. Never mind. I got an idea. Parking garage. Discovery. Go at throttle up. Twin mega base, dude. Building the octagon for rocket flights. For rocket fights. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's cool. That makes sense. That is a big building. Yep. Like I said, guys, right there is hopefully Jeb Willing, one of the first rocket facilities that's designed for mass production. We're not talking like one starship rolling off the assembly line a day here, but I'm pretty sure, just from what I've heard Elon say in the past, is that he's trying to do this. Anybody here from Ypsilanti or Michigan? Ipsy? Anybody from there? You know, Willow Run? That's what he's trying to do. I'm pretty sure that's his bench test. That. That's what he's trying to do. The only time airplanes have ever been on a moving assembly... Well, moving assembly line is when Ford did it with B-24s in World War II at Willow Run. Willow Run is... Yeah, move. it's pretty much a moving assembly line. Ford just said, Why don't we just do what we do with cars, but with planes? All right. I was thinking Ruby Ridge. Now, that's... Okay, so that's not in... That's not in um, Michigan... And also, that's something different. Uh, yeah, that's 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 different. That that's not that's not airplane production. Yeah, that's that's not that. That's that's a different thing. Actually, if you guys take a look at take a look at pictures of Willow Run, un. Freaking believable, dude. Look. Check this out. That's what that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at this, but with spaceships. Alright? This picture of Willow Run right here. So check it out. You have engine fabrication and stuff over here. All the different subassembly parts are here. And airframe production is here. 
So right here, see, see, there's two rows, right? So basically, raw materials get fed in right here. See the whole huge loading area right there? Raw materials get fed into this factory here. Or sub-assemblies, I suppose, of the fuselage and whatnot. So basically aluminum and whatnot go in here. A plane fuselage gets to here with wheels, turns around, and then has everything else outfitted. And then by the time it gets down here, planes roll out the end. See the see that extension right there? Yeah. There's a couple of out final outfitting hangers right here. So planes would turn, three hangers right there. This the hangers still exist if I'm remembering right. It is a the closest thing you're gonna get to a moving assembly line for airplanes. And like I said, they were Ford was cranking out these things basically once a week, which is absurd, even for a World War II bomber. Actually, I don't even know what their what was their production run. Hold on. We called it Yipsa Tucky. Nice. Yeah, James. Yeah, that's a little Yipsy's out in the sticks a little ways. Uh let's see. Yeah, Albert Kahn designed it. That guy was famous for designing automotive factories. Yeah, at least the building for it. I thought it was one per hour. Let me check avocado. I I have to look. I I I thought it was once a day, but I I could be wrong. Let's uh let's let's take a look. B-24H was the first air, first variant produced by Ford at Willow Run in large numbers that went into combat. B-24H differed from the early B-24s by having a nose turret. The Emerson Electric A-15 to de increase defensive firepower. Due to the many structural changes that required the first B-24... The changes required, the first B-24Hs were delivered slightly behind schedule with the first machines rolling off the production lines in June 1943. Production of the B-24H at Willow Run was 1,700 aircraft. Upon the introduction of the B-24J, all three of the Liberator manufacturing plants converted to the production of this version. The B-24J incorporated a hydraulically driven tail turret and other defensive armor modifications in the nose of the aircraft. The bomber plant produced its first B-24J in April 1944, and 1,587 of those were made. So the plant opened in 1943 and stopped in 1945. And they produced... We're over 3,000 aircraft, easily over 3,000. B-24L was the first product of the new downsized Liberator production pool. 1,200 of those. Okay. All right. 1,200 of those. Griffin, uh, Ren! Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy on the ground. Bunch of guys turning blue down here. We're breathing again. B-24M was the last large-scale production. B-24M differed. B-24M were delivered October 44, ended its production in 45. Willow Run had built 16, 1,600. A further 124 B-20Ms to, to be built by Ford were canceled before delivery. 1,600, 1,250, 1,587, 1,700. Oh, my goodness. They were cranking out 1,500 a year, give or take. Ford Motor Company built one B-24 every 63 minutes. It is an hour. It is an hour. They were building... They were rolling one off of the assembly line every hour. That's insane. Now, okay, why did I... Why do I think that Willow Run... Why do I think that Willow Run is, is what uh, SpaceX is targeting for Starship production? Why would I think that? Well... In a Starship, all, the Starship All Hands meeting from a, like a month ago, 
they basically talked to Elon talked about production of starships and where they want to go with production of starships. And he talked about manufacturing all this. And he compared all the biggest and fastest runs of production aircraft around. And what he cited as the fastest was Willow Run. So if Star Factory is aiming in Roberts Road are aiming to do what Willow Run is doing, we're going to see a starship roll off the assembly line. That means SpaceX's target. I think this is reasonable extrapolation. That means SpaceX's target production numbers are somewhere, somewhere like the B-24, which is... I mean, I don't... Okay, so the cynic in me is going, yeah, no, that's not happening. The optimist in me goes, yeah, I, please do that. Please, please do that. Please, that would be, that would, I really, you should do that. I don't even need that many with reusability. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, they should do that. An anonymous gifter gifted Lumbron a tier two sub. And Ren, you said, I got pizza. I just wanted to let you know. Oh, thanks, man. They'll need way more launch sites. So, like I said, guys, that. I think they. SpaceX talked about aircraft production in that all hands meeting and they specifically Elon Elon himself specifically mentioned Willow Run. That's why I think that that's why I think that well, if he's talked he talked a lot about Willow Run, he talked about the B24. That tells me that that's what his production target is because that's how that guy works. He said, "Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, I want to do that." It's funny because it's kind of like Henry Ford. Henry Ford was kind of this way too. Yeah, he's like, "Hmm, in the, in like a hundred years ago, he's like, mm, I want to make a car a thousand bucks so everybody can afford it. And I need a factory that's going to make a hundred thousand cars a year. And everyone's like, why do you need that? No one's ever going to do that. No one's, homeboy, no one's going to buy a car. Why Why would they do that? They got horses. And he's like, eh, just, just, just let me do this. All right? It sounds very familiar. You know, I, I want to make a, an electric vehicle that's $30,000 a pop, and I'm going to need to build a couple of new factories to get it done. We need we need to make it the best-selling car of all time. Dude, why are you going to do that? No one's going to no one's gonna buy EV cars. No one's going to buy a mass-produced EV car. No one's going to do that. E Elon, just, just hold on. It's true. I'm telling you, he's copying Henry Ford's playbook. Sorry to catch you as you're signing off. I'm not signing off. What are you talking about? The article on Wikipedia you read says that peak monthly production, Willow Run, Willow Run produced 428 B-24s with the highest production listed as 100 completed bombers flying away from Willow Run between April 24th and April 26th. By 1945, Ford produced 70% of the B-24s in two nine-hour shifts. Yeah, Snakey did. Yeah, it's kind of funny. And so did Elon, too. All right. <laughs> wow. That, like I said, it technically it's not space news, but interview with GPT-4. Yeah, check that out later. Interesting. Yeah, Willow Run was insane. The factory has been demolished. It's a um. The factory isn't there anymore. What's there right now is uh, uh, an, a self-driving vehicle test track, which just pisses me off. One of the checkout hangers is still there, and then the office building is still there. And that's, yeah, that's where Willow Run was. The single greatest aviation production factory 
or one of the one of the greatest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Self-driving autonomous vehicles, though. That's that's cool. Yeah, the airport's still there, but. Yeah, the airport's still there. But you can see where the original production run was. See right there? Ugh. That's just upsetting. Yep. There it is. It was retooled. It... Ford sold it to, or didn't sell it. Ford didn't, Ford didn't take the plant. They sold it, or the government sold it to Kaiser. And then Chevy bought Kaiser. And then that plant folded in 2008. Which sucks. But, you know, an autonomous vehicle test, driving test track is cool too, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> sorry, sorry, I'm not bitter, I swear. Anyway, so if that's what SpaceX is planning on doing, that's pretty damn absurd. And this building is definitely on scale to do that. Yeah, I like driving too, MP. Yeah, I'm not about that life. It's super cool. Just a shameless thing about Willow Run. Willow Run had actually had a conveyor... Well, not a conveyor belt. It had a turntable for airplanes. <laughs> yeah, think a roundhouse for airplanes. Oh, yeah. They ended up never... They ended up stopping using it because it was pretty useless. But really freaking cool. Really cool engineering thing. Uh, because at the... Um, let me see. There might be some pictures around of it somewhere. Uh, no, that's going to the... Oh, yep, there it is. Yeah, see? Turntable. See it? See the turntable? At the end of the production line, right, they had turntables. Uh... And those turntables, you know, the planes would go down the production line, right? And the turntable... Actually, I think it was two parallel lines. I don't... Oh, no, no. They were turning planes around. I think at the end of the production line, they were turning... Oh, wait. Hold up. Shut up. Holy shnikes. Yeah, there you... Yeah, the turntables were at the end. Look. Whoa. Dude. Okay, so I had this wrong. I thought they would go down and turn around and come back. No, no. No, no. No, 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 no. That's all sub-assemblies down there. Holy balls. Look at this. This says what everything is. Wow. That's cool. What are the vertical lines at the top? resource feeds I know that the feeding mechanism was over here starting time for each station in days prior to delivery of finished ship what the actual frick is going on that's awesome dude it's a blueprint for the for the production for willow run production uh, where where did this come from Oh, that's cool. I wonder what SpaceX's production looks like here. Now, Starship Watchers, do we just see sub-assemblies come out here? Because obviously they got to stack them, right? They got to stack the ring segments, right? How does this all go together? What comes out of the what comes out of the gates here? Because we know that there are three long rows right here. So one, two, and three. So that means they're that means they're gonna backfeed. That means they're feeding stainless steel and raw materials get fed are gonna get fed in over here. Right? They're gonna Alright. Alright. 
there's some cells right there for bulkheads. But see, they're going to load stuff over here. So SpaceX is probably going to build a big loading area on the back side of this thing, if I had to guess. What's going on over here? That's a lot of condensers. I think those are air conditioners. They could be generators, too. Not sure. Wow. They also could be loading off the back, too. Holy balls. This is a... Dude, I'm sorry. I'm geeking out because I haven't seen this operation in a little while. I haven't looked. I haven't looked. We've been just doing other things. How large is that building? That's a two-lane road right there, Dean. A dude flew a B-24 out of there regularly while Western in 1990 under the radar. That's cool, man. Does it have rail access? The only way you could get the required vehicle throughput. No, there's no rail access out here. Everything is done via Highway 4 right now. Those on the roof with the sky crane. Oh, yeah, there they are. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Yeah, that's what the helicopter was for. That makes sense, James. Yeah. Was that hell? Let's go look at Jack's picture. Does it show? Does he have any pictures of what the helicopter's moving? It's been moving air conditioners. Yep. Okay. Dude, look at the turntable. So the planes would exit final production and go into checkout. They would roll to the end of the assembly, the assembly line and then they'd turn them. Dude, I want to see this with Starship. I want to see I want to see Starship like that. Dude, I just want to see rows of Starships coming down the assembly line. <laughs> Is that bad? Is that bad? <laughs> yeah, see, they're staging all the air conditioners. That's what the Sky Crane was doing. He was picking these things up and put them, put them, putting them over here. That's a big building. I worked at Boeing, and they have some big buildings. I mean, pins, I'm not sure if we're Everett-sized here, but this is definitely Renton. Definitely Renton-sized. Um, it's not Everett-sized. That, that building is huge. We need, yes, Raptor engines per day for that. Well, floating, do you, do you remember a little while back when Elon was saying... Uh, what was he saying? He was saying like how SpaceX needs to get it to like one Raptor a day or else there's a possibility that the company could go bankrupt. And everybody was wondering why everybody was wondering why you would need to produce that many Raptor engines. Well, there's your answer. That's absurd, dude. Well, yeah, Everett is a mile long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this isn't Everett likes, but it's definitely Renton. Right? It's crazy. Hey, we talking about you? Yeah, you are. This is not as big as Everett, but it's still pretty freaking big. But this is a plant that, that this is okay. So if anybody, I'll I'll end space news here in a second. The point that I'm trying to get at here, guys, is this is we're comparing a facility that's designed to build to mass produce spacecraft to a facility that's designed to relatively mass produce aircraft. That's the fact that we're even here doing this is pretty crazy. And SpaceX has another one of these sized plants in at the Cape. They have Roberts Road, which is... I'm telling you, man. SpaceX, Elon, Elon got into his head that he needs to do this. I don't know where or who said it to him, but he said it at the last all-hands meeting. He wants to... I'm telling you. Well, not th well, thousands of starships. He probably said we need thousands of starships if we're going to colonize Mars. So what? what's the closest analog that we can find? And that would be Willow Run. One plane every 63 freaking minutes. They made 6,000 freaking planes over the course of three years. No, four, 43, 44, and 45. Yeah, three years. They made 6,000 planes, four different variants. 
That's ridiculous, man. You can see that there's a possible integration between Star Factory and Mega Bay 2. Eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's got to be on purpose. That's just absolutely absurd. The Bombardier, the Bombardier final assembly plan for the G6, G6500 and Global 7500 is maybe half that size. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You think they're gonna... Yeah, dude, they're probably moving rings right in here to stack. That's how we that's probably how we saw so many freaking super heavy boosters just kind of come out of nowhere. Uh or no, SpaceX. Is this is this that is this, hold on, that building right there with all the super heavies in it, or is it this one? The Mega Bay is dedicated, that Mega Bay is dedicated to ships. Interesting. Want the link for the Willow Run flowchart? If you, Willie, if you got something that's higher res, yes, I do. Because that's. Yeah, I mean, look at these numbers, dude. Starting time for each station in days prior to delivery of finished ship. Some of these, some of these are measured in hours. That's Discovery. that's Go ridiculous, on, dude. You got something? Is it higher res? I can see that link. Let me see. I'd be in here somewhere. What the actual heck? Dude. That's absurd. Made this image viewer. Yeah, see? See? Principal components would get done down here, and then, yeah, I thought they would go, because I was reading about the turntables, I thought they would go turn around and come back, but no, no. No, no. There's just twin assembly lines right here. Twin primary assembly, right? And then the components have through ways. So you deliver a component here, and then you deliver a component there, the plane moves down the line. See? It goes, the components get delivered sideways. That's bananas, dude. How the heck? Dude, how did you think of this? It's Factorio. It's straight Factorio in real life. Yeah, dude. What's the first stuff that... The, yeah, tube bending. Tube. The nose bucket. Small parts. Cowling. There's the presses. Planing and shearing, spars and bulkheads. Those are wing assemblies. They, they have a jig to make them. Creating and shipping. Horizontal, dude. Yeah. Fuselage components. Unfricking real, dude. They want to do that with Starship. That's That's bananas to me.
Bro, we need a space flightorio game. Imagine that game, but making rockets and colonizing the system. Space flightorio. I mean, that's what Factorio basically kind of, that's the gist of Factorio. You're building a production line to make rockets. <laughs> I can't believe that, dude. See, now, now I want to sit here and do a deep dive into how we, th how we think this is working. Because we know there's three distinct cells. I remember the last time I kind of checked in, there there were three long corridors in here. In this magical game, that'll never exist. See, part of me is like... Part of me is like, don't you think it would have been better to have these feed into the back of these high bays so you can stack it and then roll the entire ship out the side? But I think SpaceX is just like, nah, we're going to use prefab buildings, roll the rings in, build them, and then roll the ship out. But feeding it from one side and then having a ship roll out the other side seems more factorio in my mind. That dark brown lot behind the Star Factory is in a court case battle. This one right here? Phase one had three corridors. There were 12 now. Oh my gosh. Is stacking just welding rings together and wiring? I mean, 415, you say it like that, but that's a little more, more complicated than what we're kind of letting on. But yeah, for the most part. I mean, at least I think. See, now, now what I'm doing is I'm like, huh. If I was going to do this, how would I do this, knowing what I know about how these things are put together? Obviously, the engines aren't being made here. The engines are made in Hawthorne, right? So they're going to get engines in somewhere. That's an office building from... I already was wondering that, too. Office building over here. Yeah, if they built another bay, basically, right, quote-unquote, across the street right here, and then leveled this, or just took this building and moved it there, and then... Dude, I just imagine the craziest thing. Here. You want to see how cool would it be to do something like this? So, at, uh, Complex 34, right? This is a Saturn 1 launch site. See the bridge crane? The whole bridge crane can move on rails. What I'm picturing is, I mean, obviously, you know, you could just use a gantry crane for this, right? But I'm picturing a building, like a basically take a mega bay and extrude it. But then again, you kind of don't need to do that. But that would be the best way to do it, right? You have a building that if you were looking at like a side profile of the building and that's the ground, right? You'd start here and the building would slowly step higher, right? And then over here, right, you'd have, right, you'd have the mega bay right there at built into the very end of the building, and then this would be a door and starships would pop out. And inside, you'd have bridge cranes. You'd have one going here, you'd have one here, and then you'd have one here. And then you'd have one at the top of the mega bay like that, right? And then this ended up not exactly being a side profile, but you get the idea. You know, you have engines and stainless go in the back, right? And then as you start stacking Starship, you stack more and more. You move it to the next station. You stack more and more, right? Please excuse the crudity of this drawing. It didn't have time to build as a scaler to paint it. Right? 
right? <laughs> right? Something like this. And then the last thing you do is put, like, the flaps on. Right? And then Starship zips out the back. Hear me out. Excuse me, more writing. Nah, I don't think it's doing that, but maybe. Because you got to remember, like, in the, it's not one assembly line. They're building starships and super heavies. And then, yeah, Jim, maybe there's another one over here for thermal protection or something, right? Okay, keep in mind, keep an eye out if you see something like this, right? Keep an eye out if you see something like that. You heard it here first, okay? Because I don't see any particular elevation changes here. Maybe they built it due to land constraints. I, Willie, I think they built this the way that they did because they're trying to keep Starship production going while also building at the same time. We know that this was done in a bunch of different segments. Look, I mean, the roof's a couple of different colors, right? The nose cone hall is higher. Uh, yeah. So my guess is that they have... Each one of these is just making different barrel segments. So like one of them is making a thrust structure for Super Heavy. The other one's making a thrust structure for Starship. The other one is just making rings, right? And then the other one is producing like forward bulkheads and mid bulkheads and stuff. And then the parts pop out and then they just stack them over here. It's crazy, dude. Absolutely nuts. Just launch outside the door. Production, the production, the factory is facing the wrong direction to do that. How crazy would it be to actually, if there was like a tower and an OLM just on the end, just... Dude, you could... Dude, you know what, man? I'm telling you. I, I think, I think they're trying to do something like that, you know? Like, how crazy would it be? Mega Bay? The Mega Bay is just like right next to the OLM and the tower. So the Mega Bay is right here, faces this way if you're looking at it from top down. The OLM's right here, tower's right here. You roll it out of the mega base, chopsticks pick it up, put it right on there. I mean, it's got to be... You'd need some type of crazy deflector, right? But... But then again, starships can be moved on SPMTs. They were designed that way from the start, so... Ridiculous, dude. Not hard to cut a hole in the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Anyway... Good space news segment, dudes. I'm gonna jump back into Manor Lords. That was that was fun. We're gonna I wanna get back to doing more space news, if that's cool. If you guys are cool with that, I'm pretty sure you are. Um only problem at that point is the people nearby. Yeah, you might need we might need a taxiway fish, right? Little taxiway. I mean Willow Run, Willow Run's runways were not near the production exit. There's there's they, were, they weren't close. Like, they had to taxi the plane to the runway. It's weird that they said that the Starships are the tallest rockets ever launched. But the Saturn V looks a heck of a lot taller, but I guess it's about perspective. Starship's taller. Not by much, Alamander, but it is taller. Saturn V is, what, 350 feet? So about a, a little over 100 meters tall. Starship is uh, 110. With the hot staging ring, it's probably more. 110 meters. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Now, consider that time period there wasn't robotic automation. I know, James. It's it, James Smith. It, dude, it's nuts. It, Willow Run is absurd. Willow Run is ridiculous. Hey, program. What's going on? Over in the YouTube chat, dudes. Space nerd goes mid evil. All right, I'm switching over the YouTube title. I'm going to put us on the title screen here. So if someone's 